Did you have a, um, ever have a boogeyman under the bed uh, or the equivalent of that? Yeah, so most of us have a boogeyman somewhere and that boogeyman is the imagined persecutor. And uh, for most kids, those persecutors kind of fade. But for kids who have been abused uh, and the incidence of physical, sexual abuse and neglect in people who um, develop a psychotic illness in, in an adult life, it's quite high. Uh, they develop um, internal, implicit, working models of what the world is like, uh, and they struggle on. And then typically in adolescence, when uh, people are supposed to become more independent, uh, they break down. Uh, they can't uh, have enough trust to really form friendships and engage the world. And then the monsters of their childhood rise up and uh, haunt them. So it's, uh, it's Halloween every day. There's a broad continuum between um, psychotic states and uh, ordinary worries. And I'll give you an example in a second. But if there's something that maybe distinguishes psychotic experience, uh, it's an alteration of one's internal sense of self, of one's own subjectivity, uh, where uh, the sense of self begins to fade, become two-dimensional. Uh, and the formal name for this in philosophy and uh, the phenomenology of psychosis is a diminished ipsaity, a diminished sense of self. Uh, and at the same time as the self is fading and becoming two-dimensional, the self becomes an observer to one's own thoughts. So instead of uh, being a fluent actor in the world, uh, the person becomes an observer of their own internal processes. The person doesn't feel that they are fluently uh, their old self. And so when an idea occurs to them, uh, when you and I talk, we, we know that the ideas that we're formulating, that they're ideas, they come from us, it has a natural feel to it. But when you feel alienated from your own subjectivity, there's a feeling of, it doesn't feel to me like I thought this thought. The thought must have been put in my head. Uh, I feel mechanical in my relationship to the world, two-dimensional. A psychoanalyst that I much admire, Melanie Klein, uh, talked about how uh, early in life, the mind undergoes a fundamental kind of division where uh, there's a, a psychological boundary where Things that are good and rewarding are uh, attributed and associated with the self, uh, and painful things are projected outside the boundary of the self. And an everyday example of that is that when, when we say something, oh my God, my head is killing me. This is a grammatical construction that shows the presence of a persecutor. The thing that's giving you the headache is your head. It's part of you. There's nothing that's more a part of you at that moment than your, your headache, but it's it's, it's conceived of as a persecutor, as something that's bearing down on you, giving you pain. And the underlying fantasy under that is that the pristine self, the headache-free self, uh, is pure, uh, is uh, in the Elysian fields. So that basic split in the psyche, uh, one-year-old has that. I once worked with a patient who said, uh, you know, Doc, you know, I uh, enjoy talking to you, but, uh, you know, uh, let me tell you, and I don't tell too many psychiatrists this because I know they just think I'm crazy, but I, I, I hear the voice of God. You know, I, I listen to the voice of God. I mean, I'm polite to you guys, but uh, I don't really care what you say. And as soon as I leave the hospital, I'm going to stop taking the medication because it's irrelevant to my mission because I'm in connection with God. So uh, the fact that uh, this man was homeless, uh, th the fact that he had no family uh, was of no concern to him. If, if, if he's been picked by God to be an interlocutor, uh, then he has a special place in the world and he doesn't have to earn it through uh, accomplishments or money or you know, any other of the trappings of ordinary life. What the leap to concrete metaphor does is that all the associational ties uh, to the painful aspects of the person's experience disappear. They're left with a different problem. The plot lines in delusions are drawn from um, the unconscious that we all share. One uh, writes a line of poetry or reads a line of poetry that's moving. 
it connects with us the way music does. It elicits uh, an emotional dimension of things. So the language that uh, everybody uses and that psychotic people use, they don't think of it as metaphorical language about their grief. A social worker uh, who had a good you know, clinical education and clinical social work uh, was presenting a patient for discussion, uh, a 19-year-old man who had been uh, psychotic for um, six years in the clinic. Uh, you know, usual story on all different kinds of medicine and, and uh, the delusion didn't change. And his uh, central delusion was that at night when he would go to sleep, a couple would enter his body and they'd have sex inside his body. And this was very distressing to him. We've got a 19 year old man uh, and he's falling asleep. And where do his thoughts drift? Where do the thoughts of 19 year old men often drift? Uh, many 19 year old men fantasize about sex. You know, uh, at night, uh, the bustle of the day is gone. You know, you're alone in your room. So as a supervisor, uh, the thought occurred to me that uh, this kind of sounds like a special form of daydreaming, sexual daydreaming. And uh, so as a supervisor, I suggested that to the social worker. Why don't you ask about that? So the social worker uh, said in his own way, in his own style, you know, I was wondering, uh, sometimes, you know, men your age would be per perfectly normal and ordinary, you know, uh, they might be having sexual fantasies or daydreams, you know, late at night. And uh, any thoughts about that? So then the patient said, you know, now that you mention it, uh, it bothered me because I could never understand how these people were getting in and out of my body and all the social worker needed was just a little nudge to go in this area because he got it, he understood what the issue was. And uh, so the social worker asked, this is basic psychotherapy technique, you know, uh, this couple, you know, um, do either of them remind you of anyone? <laughs> and then he said, well, yeah, yeah. I, I've wondered if the woman in the scene uh, was actually uh, the first girl that I fell in love with, uh, and uh, she dumped me, you know, for another guy. And the patient actually said, I guess, you know, since, since I couldn't have her, uh, the best I could do would be kind of a voyeur and be near her, you know, while she was sexually involved, you know, with this other man. So uh, the diagnosis there on his chart was uh, paranoid schizophrenia, but the diagnosis of the heart was a broken heart. We understand what having your heart broken means, and, and we understand that it's not a cardiac ailment, uh, but you have people suffering from psychosis who have a broken heart who come to the emergency room and they want an electrocardiogram. Whether grandiose or persecutory, uh, delusions are attempts of people to make sense of the suffering in their life uh, or to find uh, daydream solutions you know, to those uh, sufferings. And those stories rise up out of uh, the person's memories of their childhood uh, and a universal kind of unconscious that includes uh, persecutory objects. So a non-psychotic person, and this is an example of the continuum, a non-psychotic person uh, might be uh, ruminating, oh, I'm such a loser, I'm such a loser, I failed again, I'm no, I am no good. Uh, when that borders over and crosses over into a psychotic state, uh, the person hears a voice that's saying, you are no good, over and over and over again. So the shift from first person to second person uh, in the internal conversation marks it as a psychotic experience where the voice is now um, disembodied, it's not felt to be part of the self, and the person hears their self-hatred um, echoing back to them through the vehicle of the voice. Uh, there are some folks who have a very high genetic loading so that the stresses of ordinary living may push them over the edge, highly biologically vulnerable. And then there are other folks who have essentially no biological uh, predisposition, but terrible things happen to them. 
And uh, these are uh, young people in combat who are forced to kill people their own age, uh, or they see uh, their uh, buddies, you know, blown up next to them. Uh, and uh, the it, it doesn't take a biological pre disposition for that to drive you crazy, and everything in between. The mind breaks at the point where life becomes unbearable, and then the person slips away into a delusional solution to things. And some interesting things have happened in uh, the last 20 years. Um, 50 years ago, there was hope that someday uh, biological psychiatry would find the schizophrenia gene, uh, the idea that like in Huntington's Korea, there's one gene you know, that's you know, making this whole disorder. It's now clear from uh, uh, very um, sophisticated and large N studies, uh, including you know, a quarter of a million people, uh, that there is no single schizophrenia gene. There are hundreds of genes, maybe even a thousand, uh, that make very minute contributions to a risk for psychosis. But that's true of, uh, <laughs> there's lots of genes that contribute to you being cranky or naive. The gene that's, that's most clearly associated with psychosis is something called the 22Q11 copy number variant. And, uh, <laughs> yep, it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> and the 22Q, uh, if you've got that allele, uh, th there's a one in four chance that you're going to have a psychotic illness. So that's bad. That's bad. That means that there's a three in four that you won't, but there's a one in four chance. Is this evidence for uh, a genetic determinant of psychosis? Yes. There's obviously a uh, strong genetic component in that, you know, that uh, family constellation. But the next question is, how many people uh, in public clinics have that allele? How much of the variance does it explain? Uh, 1%. It has explanatory power in a very small group of people. The environment plays a very powerful role in the, the release of you know, any particular genetic predisposition. Uh, are these trauma effects on the brain? Uh, are these genetic effects in the brain? And there are other independent studies that show uh, that trauma affects the brain and that many of the changes that we see in the brains of so-called schizophrenic patients uh, could be trauma-induced. So it's a deeply damaging uh, kind of uh, abuse. The mainstay of treatment of psychosis uh, in the United States uh, is, uh, and in most places in Europe, is neuroleptic medication. And um, the uh, neuroleptic medication has uh, uh, demonstrated efficacy, particularly with some acute uh, symptoms. It's not so good for so-called negative symptoms of schizophrenia. And if you look to what patients say about the impact of the medication, uh, they uh, may say something like, you know, uh, I still think about the same stuff, I still have the same ideas, but it doesn't bother me so much anymore. I, I, I don't obsess about it. My work uh, is mostly uh, psychological and psychotherapy for psychosis, but as a psychiatrist, I've written my number of uh, prescriptions, you know, over the years. I'm not against medication. Uh, medication is life-saving for some people. For some people, it makes the difference between whether they can live outside the hospital. Uh, but it's not wise for us to be waiting for the biological messiah to come and uh, deliver everybody. You've probably seen uh, those um, mannequins at gas stations, you know, where the, where the fan is blowing up the mannequin and, and the mannequin is flopping around like that. So uh, those are the acute psychotic symptoms. And then if you uh, have some neuroleptics on board, you know, that <laughs> quiets down a little bit. So uh, personally, this is just my opinion, uh, I think that uh, neuroleptics can uh, sometimes effectively ameliorate uh, some of the affective drivers of psychotic symptoms. Uh, and, uh, and, and then the person uh, has more freedom of movement because they're not uh, assailed by those uh, ideas under pressure, 
Uh, but the, you know, the ideas remain uh, and uh, certainly remain latently in uh, uh, residual symptoms. I think many people find it hard to imagine uh, something that would happen to them that's so terrible, that leaves them in such a terrible state of mind that they could lose their mind over it. And uh, that happens. That's what happens to people. And you have to be able to go to the edge of the abyss and understand uh, the depth of the feeling that drives people over the edge uh, in order to be able to uh, really be there for them and you know, help them. And uh, all that's required to understand the meaning of uh, a psychotic narrative is to approach it as though it's a personal fairy tale. It's an autobiographical play that the person has written and they're starring in it for better or worse. It's also a way that uh, you can communicate to a patient that uh, you're following them, you're understanding them, you're understanding uh, the painfulness of their story uh, without becoming overwhelmed by it. And um, it takes a little practice. It's something that young psychiatrists can be taught to do, particularly the ones that have a talent for this kind of work. There's a phrase, um, treatment-resistant schizophrenia. So uh, I think what psychiatry often does is it blames the patient uh, for the lack of efficacy of the treatment. So one could just as easily have said, well, you know, we have a situation here of uh, treatment inadequacy, you know, rather than treatment resistance. When I first started presenting the case, um, a frequent question would be, uh, always from a psychiatrist, you know, in the audience, well, you know, Patient got better, so uh, actually, uh, Dr. Garrett, I, I I think you probably had the wrong diagnosis. You know, uh, the uh, I, I don't think the patient was schizophrenic. This is an absurd tautology. Anybody who gets better doesn't have schizophrenia, which is an absurd idea for other reasons too, because uh, long-term follow-up studies show uh, that a uh, significant minority of patients recover from uh, an early history of schizophrenia. Uh, and the folks that do the best are the ones that have tapered themselves off their medication. They're not the ones that have stuck by the medication. So um, uh, a diagnosis of schizophrenia uh, it, it, uh, should not be looked at as uh, a dooming diagnosis. As you probably know, uh, most of the um, double-blind controlled trial research uh, has been with uh, CBT approaches. Uh, and not psychoanalytic approaches. But uh, this is a complicated issue because um, in order to get funded for a research study, uh, the, the limit of the intervention is typically 10 sessions. So what CBT is, um, as it was developed, it's basically a research protocol that's been exported into the clinical setting. And uh, it can be quite helpful to some patients, uh, but it's not a natural outcome of uh, clinical work with the uh, complexity and variety of psychotic people. So uh, those studies show that there is a, um, uh, a response rate and uh, a, uh, uh, an efficacy rate that is comparable to the least effective neuroleptics uh, so it, it's, it's a modest, but it's a substantial uh, uh, impact. Does that go a long time, or we don't know? Uh, there's some studies that show that it's enduring, yes, yeah. Um, the, uh, it's very difficult, not impossible, but it's, it's more difficult to do research in a psychoanalytically uh, oriented uh, treatment. Now, the problem with doing uh, research into psychotherapy that, that hinges on the relationship between the patient and the therapist, which is the kind of work I do, is the minute you sit down in a room with the person, the patient has changed you, and you've changed the patient. There's no independent variable anymore. It, it's a dance. It's, it's a, so how do you study a dance? You know, not everybody is going to have the aspiration to become an expert psychotherapist for psychosis. Uh, but all uh, mental health clinicians in, you know, encounter psychotic people in their training. And one thing that 
everybody can and must muster uh, is the intent to listen uh, with the, um, the wish to understand the meaning of psychotic symptoms. You can dedicate yourself to an intent uh, in a moment. It doesn't take advanced training. It's just, I'm going to try. Uh, I won't always understand the meaning of this story. I, I, I won't always get it. Sometimes it'll be very obscure. Sometimes I'll walk away, you know, just baffled. But sometimes I'll get it. Sometimes I'll understand part of it. Oh, I understand who that neighbor is who's coming in. That's the father. That's a proxy for the father. Uh, psychotic people are in some ways easier to understand than ordinary people because their minds are just turned inside out and, and, and you see the inner world, you know, pretty clearly displayed. It's like an opera, you know, it only has a few characters and you don't have all of this defensive layering that you might have with somebody who has a history of substance abuse or character disorder or something like that. What did it used to feel like to think your thoughts? Was it the way it is now? Uh, can you remember a time before all of this happened? Uh, and then we get into the question of what changed? There's something different now. And oh, there was an eeriness. There was a change in your feeling about yourself. You began to hear your thoughts more as though they're being spoken to you rather than you're simply thinking them. Uh, and it's after that that the computer chip idea, came, oh, I see. And, and, and then you try to put together a picture where uh, the computer chip idea is a kind of a natural consequence of explaining an anomalous state of mind. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I mean, I couldn't think of a better description <laughs> of what it felt like. So, yeah. I learned a lot from my teachers in the British CBT uh, community. Um, I was not getting um, effective results and outcomes with patients just using a psychoanalytic model. So I'm very grateful for that, actually. I'm not saying, well, you know, all you got to do is do a little psychotherapy with these folks. No, no, it's difficult work. It's doable work. It's difficult work. Uh, but um, it's the inadequacy of our treatments and approaches that, you know, lead people to be uh, treatment unresponsive. And that's not to say that there aren't some people who are so damaged uh, emotionally and biologically that they can't be reached. There are such folks. Uh, I feel uh, very comfortable with, uh, uh, you know, a uh, psychoanalytic point of view. I feel well trained enough in CBT to know what that's about, is that CBT techniques can help the therapist uh, assist the patient in exploring uh, the literal falsity of a delusional belief. So if, if you can loosen up the person's attachment to the condensation of the delusional idea, there's more freedom of thought. Uh, and you can then, if the patient wants to and is able to, you can open that out into, well, why might you have thought that in the first place? And that leads you back to their history. Uh, and that's the psychodynamic approach. So one might say, uh, at that time, you know, uh, after your mother died, you were under a lot of stress. And it, it was at that time that you started, you know, worrying about the neighbors. So um, stress and understanding the contingency of stress in the development of ideas can be very helpful to people. So um, skillful CBTers can do very good work, you know, with patients. And there are some patients who don't want to and can't, for their own psychological defensive reasons, go beyond uh, an explana a CBT explanation. And uh, so I was supervising a therapist uh, in Long Island who uh, was doing good work with the patient, uh, but the patient uh, couldn't go to his day program, uh, which he really needed, uh, because whenever he would get on the bus, he would think that people on the bus were uh, talking about him. So he would get on the bus, uh, and this is the way it goes. You know, somebody gets on the bus, and you look up at them. You look to see who's... So he interpreted those. Oh, you know, they're seeing him coming on the bus. So the result of the CBT work was to uh, help the patient um, construct uh, essentially a mantra, uh, which wasn't a deep understanding of where did his fear of people come from. But every time he would wait for the bus, he would rehearse in his mind... Uh, with a charming, ironic tone of voice, yeah. 
I guess it isn't always about me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he would say that to himself, you know, before he got on the bus. And I think that's a man who was not interested or couldn't work in a more depth way. So there's all different kinds of outcomes uh, that people can achieve. That there are some folks uh, where you do some work uh, first in establishing a safe, trusting relationship with the patient, uh, which for some people uh, is the first time they've ever had that in their life uh, with the connection with the therapist. And uh, you, you may kind of circle around the, uh, the traumas of childhood without directly recalling them. Uh, and uh, that may be enough uh, to bolster the person so that the result of the psychotherapy is the patient says, well, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm not thinking so much, you know, about uh, what happened in my family. Uh, I'm actually more concerned about uh, getting a job. And uh, doc, you know, I, I'm going to this program and uh, they need a letter from, you know, you, the person kind of just, it fades and they move on in some other direction in their life. For other folks, uh, there's a uh, improvement only comes after direct confrontation with the truth of their life. And uh, uh, some very earnest, good therapists, you know, will say, who have CBT training, you know, they'll be saying, I, I, I did what the manual required. You know, I, I think I'm following what I was taught. And I would say, yes, you are. Obviously, this is very sophisticated CBT work. And the question is, why isn't getting traction? And then from an analytic perspective, I try to offer some advice about uh, what's got the treatment stuck and uh, how could things move forward. And uh, for example, um, uh, one thing that uh, psychoanalysts uh, know a lot about is uh, masochistic character. Uh, people who are proud of their suffering. So uh, I consulted once for a man who um, he, he, he would be doing the CBT session, he'd do his homework and everything like this, uh, but nothing was changing, you know, in, in terms of uh, his belief that he was being probed by the government you know, every night. The man prided himself in his suffering and he didn't want his suffering taken away from him. So what was required in the treatment was to f find something else that he could be proud of, some, some other standing in the world uh, besides his suffering. Uh, so that's a way of combining a psychoanalytic character perspective with uh, what can be very valuable CBT work. I think I'm a good teacher of this stuff. So um, residents respond uh, and they're hungry uh, to do something more than just be pill pushers. And um, so uh, I just finished doing, um, was during COVID, a series of interviews with uh, the third year psychiatric residents where they talked about what difference did psychological training make in their treatment of patients. Uh, and uh, seven interviews with seven residents. So it wasn't just one resident who had a particular gift for it. And uh, they all were uh, quite moved and affected by the psychological training. And uh, uh, lots of different things happened. Uh, for example, um, uh, all of them were able to conduct uh, modest psychotherapeutic exchanges with patients where they understood the meaning of the symptom uh, and, and they were talking to the patient with an understanding of what the meaning was. Uh, and also, uh, it had a significant effect on their emerging identities as young psychiatrists. And uh, one woman was very touching. You know, she said, when I went into psychiatry, uh, I, I had the moral value for myself uh, to be empathic and compassionate to people. Uh, and it wasn't until I really understood the meaning of psychotic experience, I'm gonna get choked up here, but uh, that uh, I could fulfill my mission. All right, I look forward to seeing the film and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to get the word out. <laughs>